Matt Bai is the national political columnist for Yahoo News and the author of All the Truth is Out, The Week Politics Went Tabloid, an Amazon selection among the best of 2014. Congratulations on the book, Matt. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I want to ask you, back to the time when you were thinking about a book or a, a, this yeah. book, what was the moment where you identified this Gary Hart campaign of 87 as a tipping point in American culture and politics? That's a good question, John. I don't know if there was any one moment. I think... Uh, I started thinking a lot about this after I first met Hart at the end of 2002, talking to people about it. Uh, it kind of never left my mind. I covered two presidential campaigns after that. I, th I think that connection sort of slowly gelled for me. And then, uh, you know, there was a point where I started to go back and look at that moment just because I was curious. And How somebody this gifted yeah, fell from what had happened, you know. I mean, all we had were sort of the received memories. And it yeah. turned out that a lot of what I think all of us thought, I certainly did, uh, had happened in 1987 wasn't really true. There was actually a lot of things that had been solidified in the public memory that that been, that it wasn't the way it happened, um, and that really you know convinced me that hey there's a, there's a story to be told here. I think it's an important one, and I wanted to do it. Not everyone thought it was a great idea, but so you were interested in the story before you identified the story as this moment, this sh paradigm shift. Well, no, I was really interested in that in the moment. I mean, I thought the moment had significance, and mm -hmm. and realizing that a lot of what we thought about that moment wasn't true sort of indicated to me that there was a, a deeper significance Until to it. Story. And I think there is, yeah. And you mentioned that not everybody thought it was a good idea, but talk to us about the role that uh, Richard Ben Kramer played in helping you uh, decide that it was time to write this book. Well, I wrote the preface about Richard. I mean, Richard was a friend and more than that, an inspiration. He's a, just a tremendous writer and journalist uh, and, and a tremendous guy big-hearted guy, and I went to see him. I had met him a little bit. I went to see him when I was first thinking about the book, and a lot of people in Washington didn't think it was a very good idea because this was the turn of the page. It was the new Obama era, and everybody thought that's where the, you should be writing about and focusing your energy and uh, not on something that happened so long ago and something so pessimistic. Uh, and and Richard, you know, really kind of put my head right. He said to me, well, you don't, you know, people covering politics day to day can't tell where the larger sweep of history is. They can't see the significance of things. They don't know what makes great stories. They're worried about polls. They're worried about the latest development, the latest bill. He said, you, you don't listen to everybody else. You have to follow your instincts as a storyteller. You have to tell people what you think they need to hear, not necessarily what they're clamoring to hear at the moment. And I took that advice very much to heart uh, and, and continued to talk with him. So I mean, I was really saddened as were a lot of people when he died pretty suddenly last year. Yeah. A great loss. A great loss. Uh, now, pushback from critics of the book. What, what have you learned during your book tour and reading the reviews? And, and has it changed anything? Uh, if there's a uh, when the paperback comes out, will there be anything that changes? Oh well, there's lots of things that change. I've probably corrected a dozen small things in the book because you, you know, when you're sure. Yeah, yeah. You well, have, and it, history's always the great thing is now we have the opportunity to go back, change a word here and there, and it, it instantly shows up in the ebook. So yeah. I've been happy to do that. Uh, you know, I've learned. I've been doing this. A, throughout the rise of the internet era. You know, I was at the New York Times Magazine for 11 years, moved over to Yahoo. I can't open my computer without somebody getting upset. So, so uh, while there's been sporadic criticism here and there, I think, you know, even if you look at any of the reviews, reviews online, as you said, Amazon as is one of their top books, NPR has it as one of their top books. Um, you know, I, I think I think people have really well have really received it well. I mean, the individual, you know, the, there's there was well, some it's controversy. It's tricky to find a moment where things change, and you're always yeah. going to get disagreement over that. Well, and I didn't. Uh, I think if, you know a lot of the criticism you get, as with journalism now, a lot of the criticism you get when you write a book are from people who haven't actually read it or they've read <laughs> synopses, right? And right. they'll actually tell you now. They'll write you. I get notes from people saying, "I haven't read your book yet," or "I haven't read your column." Do you yet. remember but Bill Murray's movie reviews on Saturday Night Live, where he would say, <laughs> "I haven't actually, I seen haven't the seen the movie, the movie but right. I hear." There's a lot of that now, and people aren't being funny about it. Um, so, so you know, I think people do look and say, well, how can you say, what about this moment? What about that moment? You know, there was one uh, media critic who was like, well, what about Bob Dole? Bob Dole had affairs and nobody cared, so clearly this didn't change anything. I, I, I don't know if Bob Dole had affairs, and I doubt very much no one cared, but uh, I'm sure people looked into it. But the fact is, moments in history never change um, in an instant. There, no. There's no light switch that goes on and off. You, you, you always have exceptions to the rule before, exceptions after things. You know, we, we stutter step a lot in our history. So you try, you know, you try to focus in on moments that have significance where something, and, and, my, and, and it's my point here with this book, this is a moment where something manifested itself. It's not Hart didn't cause it, the Miami Herald didn't cause it. It wasn't like it was one way, one day, and everybody woke up the next day and it was something different. It's a moment where you can really see some general trends in the culture collide. 
uh, that were going to collide inevitably that already had started to collide, and that makes it interesting. Well, one, one thing that has been part of the conventional wisdom version of the story is that Gary Hart brought this on himself by challenging reporters to follow right. him. Tell us what the, the reality was in that regard. Right. Well, that's just not true from a timeline perspective. It is, it is what I thought, too, which is that Hart got up and said, follow me around. And so the Miami Herald said, okay, we'll follow you around, and they found him having an affair, and inexplicably, how could you be so dumb as to go out and have an affair when you've just said that? Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is he said that to a single reporter. He said it to E.J. Dion, who was, at that time, doing the job I later did at the New York Times Magazine, yeah. oddly. Uh, E.J. Uh, wasn't quite sure about how to use it, didn't really consider it a challenge, buried it actually in the story, but in, in any event, it took weeks for him to write and edit that piece, as magazine stories do. During that time, the Miami Herald got a tip. It began to follow that tip. It planned surveillance. It planned its coverage. Uh, that quote actually didn't run publicly, and the Herald didn't see it until the same weekend that they were conducting their surveillance and came out with the story. Um, I, I, there's absolutely nothing in the public record or that anyone has ever said to suggest they even saw that quote before they were standing outside Hart's house. That's what Tom Fiedler, the lead reporter on the story, repeatedly told me and had repeatedly told others. Now there's some talk about the, from the former Herald guys, wait a minute, you know, maybe we saw it the day before or 48 hours before. It doesn't matter. No one contends that it actually had an impact it, it wasn't the big on the part scandal. Of the story it wasn't it, the thing the that drove the story, it, yeah. and we all, we all think it did. Is there any indication that uh, this type of coverage, this tabloid-type coverage, will reach its peak and change, or are we just now lost in a land of uh, immediate 24-7 fodder for the machine? I don't know. I mean, uh, you know, technology changes things. And generations change things. Mm -hmm. And we have both of those things going on. We have generational transition that's always happening. And we have this incredible new technology in the Internet that we're still just in the infancy of. So it'll change in ways we can't yet foresee. I think the thing, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have a way to change it. But I think the thing I, I'm saying to my industry, in a sense, is let's rethink the culture of political journalism. Let's rethink the idea that our job is to be a heat-seeking missile that, that, you know, we're here to find your flaw, to find the lie, to expose you in some way, rather than to understand what, what you think, what you believe, to give you the chance to express ideas or worldviews. We created a process that doesn't benefit the democracy. Because otherwise, we're diminished. I mean, the last chapter in your book, A Lesser Land, you right. feel that this is a diminishing process. Right. Well, which comes from a quote earlier in the book where, you know, Ben Bradley says when, when, when John Kennedy dies, Ben Bradley writes that we're a lesser land for not having him. And then later when he talks to David Frost, and I recount this interview in the book, uh, you know, he says, um, he, he, you know, he's, he, he says he's glad that they got Hart and that Hart brought it on himself and you can't do what Hart did. And, and David Frost says to him, well, you said that we were a lesser land for losing John Kennedy, who did all of these things too. How long did you believe that? And, and Bradley says, I believe it still. Mm -hmm. And so my point in bringing back that echo at the end of the book is that we've, you know, we're confused about this. We're conflicted about this. We've created a process where we do drive good people out of politics uh, who have something to offer, where we keep good people out of politics, and we open the door for people who maybe shouldn't hold public office. Well, final thought about Gary Hart. Uh, you end the book with one word, character, describing him. You, you come to admire him through your interaction and through coverage of the story. Is it a, a huge loss for the country that this man was uh, pushed out of the political arena because of well, this one incident? I think it's a loss in taking the presidency aside. I think he would have been a good president. But, uh, and, and others, you know, there were those who were there and I was not at the time who think he wouldn't have been. But regardless, I think when you have someone that uh, brilliant and focused on the issues and driven to serve and for all the right reasons, there's, no, there's never been any uh, question or speculation about his ethics or his relationship to contributors or any of this. Uh, you know, who wants to serve, who wants to be of service, and he is now the special envoy to Northern Ireland, just happened mm -hmm. in the last few weeks. Um, you don't want, you can't afford to lose people like that. We don't have, you know, such a perfect situation in this country that we can afford. That right, we can't afford to lose people who have contributions like that to make over uh, something like this. And, uh, and a lot of the book is about this concept, uh, as, you, as you point out, of, of character. A lot of the book is really a question of how do we define it, how broadly, in what context. Um, you know, and, and character for much of the life of the nation had to do with um, your honesty to your constituents, whether you duck tough votes, whether you tell people things they don't want to hear, whether you would do what a contributor wanted rather than what was in the public interest. Uh, we've narrowed the focus of someone's character so dramatically in the last 20 years, 25 years. And, and that, is, that is a lot of what is at the, at the heart of the book, is, is asking ourselves, what is this character we want in our public servants? And are we really uh, making demands that match what we need from our leaders?
And that's a very important question, Matt. Thanks for raising it in the book. And I should say, Matt is not only a, a great political reporter, but he's a terrific writer. I mean, it's really well, a fun read. It's really, it's, it reads well. I appreciate that. And it's great to be back at, Will, at the Wilson Center because you all, uh, you know, really helped make the book possible. I did a lot of the work uh, here and with the support of everyone here. So um, yeah, I'm very grateful well, for good that. Good to see you back. Thanks. Thanks. Take care, Matt.